Lotus Asian Voices, bringing you news, views, and interviews from Buddhist communities across Asia. Welcome to the inaugural issue of Lotus Asian Voices, brought to you by the Lotus Communication Network from Singapore. I am Kalinga Seniratna. This monthly program will focus on Buddhist countries and communities across Asia. And we will be featuring news, analysis and interviews of issues that are of concern to the communities. It will include political, social, cultural, economic, development or cross-cultural communication issues. Using the Engage Buddhism concepts, we will try to analyze and interpret these issues from a Buddhist perspective. In this month's program, we will pay a tribute to the Vipassana meditation master Essen Goenka, who passed away in India in September. We will also be looking at the revival of the Nalanda education tradition and profile the Nava Nalanda Mahavihara in Bihar, Northern India. We also look at gender and Buddhism, focusing on the efforts to revive the order of nuns in Cambodia. And in the cultural segment, we bring you some Buddhist orchestral music from China and Sri Lanka. All this in our inaugural issue of Lotus Asian Voices. Satya Narayan Goenka was born in Myanmar or Burma in 1924 and he died in Mumbai in India on the 29th of September last year at the age of 89. Goenka ji did not set out to be a Buddhist monk or a meditation guru. He was a successful Indian Burmese businessman who happened to come across the teachings of the famous Burmese monk and meditation master Syagui Yu Ba King under whom he trained for 14 years. In 1969, he shifted to India and started teaching meditation and started a meditation center at Igatpuri near Nashik. Over the past 30 years, Goenkaji has almost single-handedly spread the Buddhist teachings of awareness meditation or vipassana meditation right across the world. Such meditation techniques have now become a common feature of the healthcare system in many countries. Goenkaji has emphasized in his teachings that meditation is not spirituality nor a religion, but he did work within a specific Buddhist tradition and created a very rigorous format designed to attain certain levels of mental understanding with his trademark 10-day silent retreats. In this talk, which he gave in Sydney in 1982, Goenkaji talks about the basic concepts of vipassana meditation. At the conscious level, at the intellectual level, one keeps on fooling oneself, deceiving oneself. I am such a dhamma person. I understand dhamma so well. I understand teaching of Buddha so well. I can write books on that. I can give lectures on that. I can discuss with people and establish the teaching of Buddha as the best teaching in the world. But at the actual level, deep inside, the same craving, the same aversion, one keeps on talking about this anicca, anicca, everything impermanent, impermanent. But one keeps on developing tremendous amount of attachment to whatever one likes. Tremendous amount of aversion, whatever one doesn't like. And keeps on generating nothing but misery, nothing but misery. One keeps on talking that there is no Atta, there is no I, there is no me, there is no my. But keeps on building tremendous amount of ego. I, I, mine, mine. One keeps on talking about misery, 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 but cannot do anything to come out of the misery because all this intellectual game does not help. We keep on wasting our entire life either playing this intellectual game, I understand the teaching of so-and-so, now I understood the teaching of so-and-so, or the emotional game, devotional game, because so-and-so has said that, and I have got great devotion in this person, so this is perfect, perfectly all right, I accept it. Merely accepting the reality at the intellectual level, or accepting the reality at the emotional or devotional level, does not work. One has to accept it at the actual level, apply it in practice, and that cannot be applied unless you develop your own wisdom at the experiential level, going deep inside. And that is what is called Vipassana. Vipassana is to observe the reality as it is. Mm-hmm. 
Acharya Vadi Vangsako is a former Thai businesswoman who was involved in the glamorous world of trading in diamonds. She started a successful Thai jewelry line, Saint Tropez, in 2001, but she gave it all up eight years later. She is now a well-known Vipassana meditation master with a large following in Thailand. In addition, she teaches meditation in prisons and slums across the city and written books in Thai. She has also set up the School of Life in Thailand's Sukhumvit area to impart morality and meditation to Thai youth. Recently, she spoke to Lotus Asian Voices about how she became a Vipassana meditation practitioner and teacher. I was a businesswoman, very successful one, but then I realized that what is my goal of life? Because I have to every single year I have to uh, increase my target, business target, and I can feel a peaceful and harmony in what I do. I wonder, is this? The way of living, it's not supposed not supposed to be like this because we, as a Buddhism, I heard about uh, peaceful and harmonious. But for what I'm living, even though I'm so successful, but I don't feel the real happiness inside. So I'm starting to search which way that could lead me to meet the real happiness. You know, where is it? What is the true happiness? That's all. I learned about Buddhism by reading. I don't. I know just like uh, in the common knowledge, like most Buddhists know. Like if you Buddhism, you have to don't do bad thing. It will be sin. You know, do good merit. You know, all kind of that. But it's not deep enough. Especially when someone said you have to be compassion. I don't understand because sometimes I want to feel compassion even to my enemies. But I can't because my heart is feel anger, I feel very angry. So I can't be truly compassion. So it must be something about the mind. It's not about the word. So when my friend introduced me into the meditation course of the Master Goenga, and because I want to find the true happiness and I want to fix my self problem. I used to be very hot tempered then, and finally I was the student of the Master Goenga. To get into the real practitioner of vipassana, you are supposed to go through a ten-day course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now, is it necessary to go through the ten-day course to be a real practitioner? It, it doesn't mean ten days, but I mean it's necessary to go into practicing level. You can reach Dharma by reading, by trying to understand. Buddha himself. Is not learned from reading. He learned from searching into his own soul, his own mind. That's why he know the reality of the world. For your answer, I said it's a must. You know, you must do it. You will, you will see Dharma by your own heart. Vipassana is getting popular right around the world, and there's not only Buddhists. A lot of other people who are not Buddhists are also practicing it now. Mm-hmm. And often it is said that it's art of living, and you don't need to be a Buddhist to practice vipassana. Yes, it's correct. But uh, first, please allow me to to tell the difference between meditation and vipassana meditation. Meditation we have not only for Buddhism. Meditation means you have your mind focused into one thing, have conscious into one thing, which is uh, many many religion have. But vipassana meditation, vipassana means seeing. You can see things the way it is and just observe without having any reaction. And by just let your mind seeing the reality with your the mind with conscious, you will know the ultimate truth about yourself and about the world. But before you can. See, go into the ultimate truth. You have to practice your mind to be still first, to be firm, to be in conscious. I mean, you have to do from the meditation level, and then from the meditation, then you use a very still mind to go. Just look at it. Just see it. Just know it, which is called vipassana. Usually, people are uh, uh, like to react. You know, when we say something that we don't like, we say no, we don't like. When something we like, we say oh, I want more and more and more. Which call we never learn to be equanimous. Even learn to just acknowledge it without, without reacting it. But if you learn to do, 
without reacting it, then you will see the reality as it is, not as you want it to be. This is called vipassana, and with the vipassana, will help you to have more wisdom. And even if you are not a monk, you still can practice. And in fact, you need to practice. Otherwise, you will conduct your life wrongly. That was Archavadi Mansakun, a Vipassana meditation master from Thailand. The Cultural Revolution in China in the 1970s almost destroyed religion and traditional culture in the People's Republic. But since the end of the upheavals in 1978, there has been a major revival of both Buddhist and Taoist practices in China. This piece is a percussion used to inaugurate the altar at the opening of a ritual before the deities are welcome to participate. Nalanda had been a, a big center of, uh, we can say, connected with the Indian culture. Not only talking about the spread of Buddhism, but I think uh, spread of Indian culture and to that aspect, the spread of humanism, Nalanda is a basic center. That was Dr. Ravindra Pant, the director of the Navanalanda Mahavihara in Bihar, India. Nalanda Mahavihara is regarded as the forerunner to the modern system of university education. The ancient seat of Buddhist learning flourished for nearly 700 years between the 5th and 12th century AD before it was burned down by invading Turkic Mughal armies. Since its huge library was burned down, Nalanda was rediscovered thanks mainly to the writings of the Chinese scholar monk Venerable Shang Xuan, who spent many years at Nalanda, both as a student and a teacher. And upon his return to China, he wrote some 35 volumes of books with vivid accounts of his experiences at Nalanda. We find uh, from the records of uh, Master Xuanzang, you know, who visited this place in 7th century, talks about the grandeur of this uh, wonderful university, a center of learning, where, you know, as per his uh, records, you know, 10,000 monks were studying here. The place was uh, in such a harmony and uh, his record says that uh, actual site, you know, was almost 16 square kilometers. But what we have now at the moment, uh, the excavated site is only 1.6 kilometer. So a, a lot of Nalanda is yet to be found. As Nalanda, we, we find that uh, uh, there had been a lot of interaction even in the ancient time with the other regions far off, you know, up to uh, China, Tibet, Korea, Turkey, uh, Southeast Asian countries. So there had been a lot of uh, impact of the Nalanda culture on these uh, regions and as a result, a lot of people came here and a lot of uh, Acharyas or the teachers went out to different countries for spreading Buddhism and Indian culture. In the ancient Pali language, a vihara is a seat of spiritual and intellectual learning. And a collection of such viharas lead to a mahavihara, which is a great seat of learning. In order to revive the lost glory of Nalanda, in 1951, the first president of independent India, 
Dr. Rajendra Prasad, declared that the ancient seat of Buddhist learning at Nalanda would be revived. Thus, the state government of Bihar established the Magadha Institute of Postgraduate Studies in Pali and Allied Languages and Buddhist Learning at Nalanda in 1951. Later, it became known as Navanalanda Mahavihara. When it was created in 1951, at that time it was basically a, a research and academic institute. It is one of the pioneer institutes for uh, the studies of Pali and Buddhism. For the first time, the entire Pali uh, Tipitak was published in 41 volumes along with some uh, Attakathas by this institute in Devanagari script. So we had this tradition, you know, of keeping Pali tradition and, uh, you know, Buddhist studies. And it was under government of Bihar. In 1994, it was taken over by government of India, central government, by Ministry of uh, Education. So now it is uh, under Department of Culture as an autonomous uh, institution. And it got deemed university status in 2006. So from 2006, it's giving its own degrees and, uh, you know, certificates and all that. Today, the university library holds 52,000 books, including some rare Buddhist manuscripts and copies of Sun Sang's writings. There are about 525 students studying here, with 20% of them from overseas, mainly monks from Southeast Asian countries, such as Myanmar, Laos, Thailand and Cambodia. The student population is a mixture of monks and lay people as well as men and women. I came to Nalanda University because I have some suggestion of abbot in Thai temple. He suggested me to study here because here is Mahavihara, is the center of Buddhism in the world. Actually, Nalanda is very famous in our country also, you know, among the monks. There's no monks who doesn't want to come to Nalanda, want to get higher knowledge. Two students studying at Nalanda Mahavihara. Venerable Pansi Manipet from Laos and Venerable Sumana from Myanmar. The university offers mainly postgraduate courses with MA programs in Pali, Sanskrit, Hindi and English as well as in Philosophy, Ancient History, Culture and Archaeology, Buddhist Studies and Tibetan Studies. They also have undergraduate level courses in Pali, Chinese and Tibetan Studies. The university gives priority to the teaching of the Pali language and Buddhist Studies. Though it is not spoken in India today, Pali is the language that was used in this part of India where the Buddha taught his philosophy 25 centuries ago. Professor Rajesh Ranjan is the head of the department of Pali at Navanalanda Mahavihara. To know the ancient Indian culture, this ancient Indian language has vital role to play. Without knowing these languages or the studying these texts, anybody who, who so far is interested to know the ancient Indian civilization, it is not possible to get as much as information as without knowing Pali. Not only that the Buddhist teaching, but the geography, history, all kinds of information are there. Professor Ranjan argues that the Pali language has had a great impact on Southeast Asian languages, particularly Burmese, Thai, Laotian and Khmer. Thus, Pali is important to understand the elements of their languages as well. From the day of its inception, we have many students from different parts of Asia. And we welcome students from different corners of Asia so that they should know the importance of Buddhism. They should know the scripture in the direct language. And then they can act like a messenger of Buddhism to their country or like the messenger of India to their country. So in this way, this institution is symbol of Asian Renaissance. We are catering, we are moving in that direction. We want to make all countries together. You have been listening to a profile of Navanalanda Mahavihara. In our next program, we will profile the Central University of Tibetan Studies in Sarnath, India, which has revitalized the Nalanda tradition in Tibetan Buddhist education. Now we bring our second cultural segment. Sri Lanka has had many types of drums in use from ancient times, and reference to these is found in the classical literature. Although around 33 types of drums are mentioned, today one could find only about 10. 
These drums are therefore unique to Sri Lanka, and the rhythms played on them are also found only here. We now introduce to you ceremonial drums from Sri Lanka, which are used in modern day ceremonies such as weddings or opening ceremonies. Buddhist heritage going back to the 5th century, which is epitomized by the ancient Hindu Buddhist monuments of Angkor Wat. This heritage was almost destroyed during the communist Khmer Rouge rule under Pol Pot in the 1970s. Thousands of Buddhist monks were killed and temples destroyed. But since the UN supervised elections in 1993, there's been a revival of Buddhism in the kingdom. Yet Chan Sabunwi, a Cambodian Buddhist, laments that her religion needs to transform itself from being too ritualistic to applying its teachings to improve the society, especially its moral and ethical standards. At the end of the Pol Pot rule, Cambodia was a country that had more women than men. And as Sabunwi explains, it created some unique problems. That time, so I was very active with human rights group and um, my job to lobby with uh, the Congress, with the government. We, we still get painful in, in our mind, you know, what, what we can do uh, with conflict, with violence, you know. Um, people still, you know, like um, too, too many um, political parties and they still, you know, want to, um, you know, get a chance of fighting and no solution. And but but women, when, one of the time when we looking for women in um, the children, we we really want to get peace in this country. We want to talk about peace. We want to do a reconciliation in this country. But how come? And we try to look in many ways, but the best way that we can do okay through to the temple. You're right. They, they feel free to talk. You know, that the temple. And like with the monk, with the, the Buddha, that the soul, we don't care about anything, but we talk about what we want. Also, I try to look for women, how they understand about Buddha philosophy. None at all. They just uh, came into the temple, clean up and serve uh, food. We want them to get gender equality the same long, you know, like um, some uh, nun, they thought they um, practice 10 precepts, but 10 precepts what mean the real practice that they need to to, to do for, for the rule. They, 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 really, they really don't know, you know, so and also the monk don't teach them. The monk just and do some like uh, traditional ceremony, blah, 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 blah. We need to promote women, you know, understanding about Buddha philosophy. <laughs> they just, they just uh, practice, you know, like uh, from their parents. It, like, um, you know, like a family, family religion, not, not real Buddhism. In 1995, Sabunwi was able to get financial assistance from a German foundation to set up the Association of Nuns and Lay Women of Cambodia to train women to be agents of social change. It initially had 7,000 members in 13 provinces. 
She is today the secretary of the association. After we formed the Nun Association, we um, trained them, um, know about the rule of the nun, understanding about Buddha philosophy, and also we combine with social work um, rule, but you know through by Buddha, Buddha philosophy. When they get back to the temple, they take action. They can be a social work. Example like domestic violence. People, you know, um, have conflict in in their family, and especially alcoholic. Yeah, they get many problems. You know, when men get drunk, and also non convenient. You know, to talk with the people that mong, especially for women. And right now we have uh, many problems with the girl, you know, at high school, um, sick or something happened. Economic grow too fast, and people they just do like stupid thing. Free law, people can drink under the age. You can smoke like under the age. Okay, they don't care. But you know, after they get trouble, some students that people cannot give them advice, so they can share with them the, the nun, and then the nun can you know um, take care of them. Um, traditional in here, they respect to the old people. Um, the problem is we need to encourage them. We need to to educate them how to deal with the situation. The movement towards making use of nuns as social educators has somewhat stalled. But Subunvi believes that this movement needs to be reinvigorated to guide young people. Problem with education, but not problem about the uh, counseling. Because counseling they need someone that have life experience. Some monks not have did not have experience at all. But none have to be a counselor. We have come to the end of our inaugural issue of Lotus Asian Voices. This program was produced and presented to you by myself, Kalinga Siniviratna. And it is a production of the Lotus Communication Network. Join us again next month. Until then, may you all be well and happy. <laughs>